for you. Good afternoon. The uh, subcommittee uh, will come to order on oversight and investigation. Um, I'll start with my opening statement. Ladies and gentlemen, we are convening this hearing um, of the Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigation to gather information concerning the Department of Energy's stimulus spending. This is the first oversight hearing focusing on DOE's role in the stimulus program since the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009 was signed into law by, the President, by President Obama just over two years ago. We will hear today from the Department of Energy and from DOE, Inspector General, and the U.S. Government Accounting Office, the two chief overseers of the Department spending, which have produced 50 reports on DOE's stimulus between them. This happens to be the first time both the IG and the GAO have testified together on DOE stimulus spending as well. In 2009, DOE was appropriated about $36 billion under the Recovery Act to increase taxpayer spending on energy efficiency, environmental cleanup, loan guarantees, and various energy-related research, development, and deployment projects and activities. The appropriation was in addition to the DOE's annual funding of about $28 billion and represented an unprecedented expansion of taxpayer spending by the Department of Energy. This unprecedented spending was accompanied by promises that the program would stimulate economic growth create jobs, clean the environment, and transform our energy infrastructure. I, along with all of my Republican colleagues, was, were strongly against the Act's massive government spending. This was not the way to stimulate the economy and create jobs. So the question is, how are things going? Let's review some of the information to date. The agency hit its own target generally for allocating funds, but today, over two years later, only about $12 billion of the $33 billion allocated has actually been spent. The whole point of the Democrats' stimulus bill was to spend billions of dollars in the hope that such spending would stimulate the economy and, of course, create jobs. It doesn't appear that this massive increase in spending has done either. Most of the money still hasn't been spent, and unemployment still stands at almost 9 percent. While the Department had existing weatherization and energy-efficient programs, there was nothing shovel-ready about expanding this on the scale that was dreamed up by the administration. As the GAO has documented, efforts to safeguard taxpayers' funds, clear up wage requirements, and state and local infrastructure issues slowed the promised $12 billion in spending considerably. Only recently, nearly three years after the financial crisis, has DOE even reached the halfway point of the 580,000 home it promises to eventually weatherize under this program. In addition, questions of cost effectiveness and performance remain. For example, with regard to the weatherization program, the GAO, GAO informed staff of one case in which contractors were hired to install new windows on every house on a Houston neighborhood street without any clear measure of whether this was the most cost effective way to help the homes save energy. In an Illinois program, a DOE Inspector General audit found 12 of 15 weatherized homes visited failed inspections because of substandard workmanship. Tennessee conducted its own state audit and found in 45 percent of 184, excuse me, of 84 weatherized homes that, quote, contractors had not performed weatherization measures, had not properly completed weatherization measures of any kind or had performed work that was not allowable under the program. So clearly there's a need for close oversight and scrutiny of these projects. The DOE stimulus funds awarded up to 10,000 jobs with the $6 billion allocated for environmental cleanup. But contractors are already finishing some of the work and announcing the end of these 2,000 of, of 2, of these jobs. It's good that the funds help keep some people working during the tough economic times. Yet when the spending ends, can the agency show that this work reduced environmental risk or future cleanup costs, or that these stimulus funds are doing any more than just creating short-term temporary jobs? Is DOE even tracking how the cleanup spending achieves long-term environmental cleanup goals? GAO has reported that this past summer, the DOE's alleged future savings from the, the Recovery Act's acceler accelerated cleanup spending 
overestimated taxpayer savings by almost 80 percent. So this committee's oversight responsibilities require that we hold the DOE accountable for measuring its Recovery Act, spending in a way that we can evaluate whether or not it was cost effective in terms of policy goals and just good fiduciary sense. With that, I welcome the witnesses and yield to the distinguished lady from Colorado for the purposes of an opening statement. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I think it's important that this committee do oversight, and I'm glad that we are looking at the agencies under our jurisdiction. I don't think we're always going to agree on energy policy issues, but I do think we can do oversight in a productive, bipartisan way. So I hope this hearing today on, on the DOE will look at ways to improve DOE programs that are promoting jobs and innovation and not simply just be an opportunity for people to rail against the uh, Recovery Act. In the face of one of the worst economic crises this country's ever seen, the American Recovery and Re Reinvestment Act was an unprecedented effort to create and save jobs, increase overall economic activity, spur long-term growth, and promote innovation. It also contained a number of DOE-specific provisions to support the transition to an energy, a clean energy economy. The Recovery Act has already had a tremendous positive impact. It provided $288 million in tax cuts and benefits for millions of families and businesses. It increased funding for a number of programs, including extending unemployment benefits by $224 billion. Um, in the weatherization assistance program, for example, which enables low-income families to reduce permanently their energy bills by making their homes more energy efficient, we've weatherized 330,000 homes. What this does, as well as giving jobs to the people involved, it saves those families an average of almost $5,000 on their energy bills over the next decade. Ultimately, Recovery Act funds will help pay to weatherize $600,000, I'm sorry, 600,000 homes, saving those families billions of dollars in utility bills. So again, it's just not the short-term jobs that were created, but it's the actual weatherization that will save the families um, uh, billions of dollars. In Colorado, for example, the Recovery Act sponsored state energy program provided funds to schools and local businesses. These funds helped the Calhan School, which is a rural public school northeast of Colorado Springs that was struggling with a worn out boiler and failing temperature controls. Recovery Act funds allowed the school to install a newly high, new highly efficient heating and cooling system using a ground source system so stu students can focus on learning, not just keeping warm or cool. Success stories like this can be seen across the country. In Virginia, James Madison University's Center for Wind Energy received $800,000 from the state energy program to build a wind testing and training centers geared towards students and companies who want to break into the wind and industry. Tennessee used Recovery Act funds to build up its solar installation grant program, allowing for rapid expansion in the solar installation industry keeping people employed when they needed it the most. And, Mr. Chairman, in your own state, Recovery Act funds helped install solar and wind power on existing billboards, which ended up saving the state $232,000 in energy costs. Mr. Chairman, I've got a letter from Philip uh, Giudice, who's the Commissioner of the Massachusetts Department of Energy Resources and Chair of the National Association of State Energy Officials, which talks about many of these um, accomplishments, and I'd like to ask unanimous consent to enter it into the record at this time. By unanimous consent. Thank you. The letter says that, quote, energy-related ERA funds being deployed by the states have been a resounding success in terms of economic development, technology innovation, efficiency, and energy savings. It also notes that the National Weatherization Assistance Program under ERA has completed energy efficiency improvements, lowering energy bills for hundreds of thousands of elderly and other low-income citizens across the country. Um, I'm disappointed that um, we didn't get to have our minority witness uh, like Mr. Judy C., uh, here today because states have been I really heavily involved in administering Recovery Act funds through some of these initiatives 
and they would have been able to provide us with a really important perspective on how the states are using this money. Um, beyond the goal of promoting economic recovery, the Recovery Act was also designed to promote oversight, and it provides for an unprecedented level of oversight to identify and prevent waste. And so I'm hoping we can hear today how those efforts have gone and if we need to improve them, exactly how we can improve those efforts. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Generally yields back. Um, I just would indicate we share your interest in the hearing, uh, the perspective of the different states um, who, I who did receive DOE stimulus funds and were responsible for administering them, and perhaps in a later, later hearing we will probably perhaps bring in your state, my state, and others. So appreciate you bringing that to my attention. And we recognize the gentleman from Oklahoma, uh, Mr. Sullivan, for one minute. Thank you, Chairman Stearns, and thank you for holding this important hearing today on oversight of the Department of Energy stimulus spending. Democrats contended that the $787 billion stimulus was needed to jumpstart the economy and add jobs. But as Republicans predicted, the stimulus has not worked. It has only added to our deficit, now at $14 trillion, and has done little to help unemployment, which was 8.1 percent when the stimulus was signed in 2009 and rose to 10 percent at the end of that year, and now is at 8.9 percent. DOE received approximately $35 billion for programs and activities through the stimulus, making the agency, as some have said, the largest venture capital organization in the world. This sum was, was dwarfed by the Department's annual budget of about $27 billion. This overnight infusion of a huge amount of taxpayer funds has caused a number of problems and concerns with wasteful spending. The risk of waste, fraud, and abuse increases dramatically whenever there is pressure to spend large amounts of money quickly. Lack of controls and monitoring at the state level also increase the likelihood that stimulus dollars were wasted on the wrong projects. I look forward to the hearing from our independent panel of witnesses from the GAO and the Department of Energy and, uh, Inspector General's Office, and I yield back the balance of my time. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. And the gentleman from California, Mr. Bill Bray, is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you holding this hearing. <clears throat> you know, Mr. Chairman, uh, we, we were allotted one day to mark up the bill that they created this major funding, and, you know, the old um, majority uh, contended that the seven – $787 billion was needed immediately for a jump start. Um, the fact is, uh, at the time that we were confronting that, I think we were about 8% eight um, uh, uh, unemployment across the country. Um, and the fact is, is that last I checked, I think there was uh, uh, only about 12% of this has been spent. I think the DOE has received about $35 billion in this program and uh, for, the, for the stimulus. And the sum that they're um, looking at uh, really is one that I think we've got to be conscious of what are we getting for, for this investment. Mr. Chairman, uh, we were at 8 percent, uh, and we're uh, in California, we're now at 12 percent unemployment. I think that we've got to recognize that there is uh, not necessarily a successful uh, program when it comes to saving the economy or jobs, and I just have to say that a lot of people look to uh, a lot of these strategies in conservation as being a way of, of maintaining good job development. I'd just like to point out that California has led the fight on energy conservation, um, and we're at 12 percent unemployment. It hasn't done us very well. Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to point out again that this town doesn't make uh, mistakes just by trying new things or by making mistakes. The biggest problem in this town is that when it tries new things and makes mistakes, it won't admit it and go back and correct it. And that's been our greatest flaw. And I'd just like to um, ask again that um, those who do not learn from history um, are damned to repeat it, contrary to what people think. The great expense of the, of the WPA project did not create a strong economy for the United States. In fact, it wasn't until we started producing products and exporting it out of this country that the American economy responded, and that government funding for government jobs were not the stimulus that pulled this country into the greatest economic powerhouse it has become historically. It was investment by private sector for um, manufacturing, something that we ought to go back and visit, and not try those failed policies that appear to have failed again. Yield back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, at this point, I think on this side we've finished and uh, recognize uh, 
The gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman, ranking member. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Two years ago, President Obama took office in the middle of one of the most significant economic crises this country has faced. After years of lax oversight, the financial industry had collapsed and the recession it caused resulted in a loss of over 8 million jobs. Within 60 days of his inauguration, the President signed into law the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. This law was designed to create new jobs and save existing ones, spur economic growth and foster accountability in government spending. Since then, the Act has saved millions of jobs and supported projects around the country that conserve energy, promote innovation, and save taxpayers' dollars. Today, the subcommittee is examining implementation of the Recovery Act within the Department of Energy. This is an important subject for oversight, and I commend the Chairman for holding this hearing. We need to ensure that the rigorous oversight mechanisms set in place by the law are operating consistent with the law's design and that the Recovery Act is implemented effectively. I'm concerned, however, about a pattern emerging from this committee. What we have seen in the past couple of months is a series of hearings in which my colleagues on the other side seem more focused on bluster than oversight. The committee has become proficient at leveling complaints about government programs that have no foundation in fact, and we never seem to find time to figure out how to make government work more effectively or how to save the taxpayers' money. And the committee has failed to move forward one single initiative to create jobs for the American people. At this point in the last Congress, uh, we had passed and the President had signed into law both the Recovery Act and legislation to expand the state child health insurance program. Uh, we're just months away from passing even more legislation, such as the Cash for Clunkers bill that boosted the American auto industry. Each of these initiatives provided critical economic support for families hard hit by the recession. What we've done so far in this Congress, this committee's top priority was a bill to restrict women's access to health insurance for abortion. Earlier this week, we approved a bill to cut off EPA's authority to regulate greenhouse gas emissions that are contributing to climate change and threatening public health. Today, we're voting on a bill on the House floor to defund national public radio. It won't save a cent of money. It's only punitive to punish uh, NPR for not being Fox News. Uh, and the House passed a budget that would put hundreds of thousands of Americans out to work out of work. If it only put them out to work, that would be good. Not one of these bills create jobs. In fact, with respect to DOE programs, we're discussing at today's hearing the Republican funding resolution, H.R. 1, threatens over 40,000 construction and permanent jobs as well as billions of dollars in investments in major solar, wind, geothermal, and biofuels projects. My colleague from California a minute ago said, the problem in this town is people never admit they were wrong. Well, I'm waiting for a Republican to admit they were wrong about the American Recovery Act because that bill saved jobs. No Republican voted for it. It saved jobs and it's done a lot for our infrastructure. Can't they at least admit, admit they were wrong? Republicans promised to govern by the cut-go rule, but, but the impact of their legislation instead has followed the cut-jobs principle. The major bills brought to the floor reduce employment and opportunity for growth. This committee has jurisdiction over many areas where we could be legislating to spur the economy. I'd like to see the committee resume its position as a leader in promoting economic growth and jobs. Today's hearing could be a first step in that process, and I hope it will be, Mr. Chairman. The DOE Inspector General and the JO have been conducting rigorous oversight to review implementation of the DOE Recovery Act. They're important witnesses. But we, we asked to invite a witness, a state official, who was implementing the legislation, we were told we couldn't have them. Mr. Gett put into the record a statement uh, from a state official who has many positive things to say about the program. That's in the committee record. But we were not allowed to have that witness testify today. That failure to include witnesses like this one makes me concerned that we're continuing down the same road we've been going down since this Congress began. We're not passing legislation that creates jobs and strengthens our economy. Instead, we're simply engaging in partisan sniping over programs 
that my Republican colleagues do not like. Why they don't like them, I don't know. But they don't like them, I guess because it was a Democratic Congress and a Democratic administration. But that's not a good enough for reason for me. I hope we can do better, and the American people need us to do better. And we need to do better on a bipartisan basis and not just use our time here for partisan sniping. I'm glad I don't do things like that. Yield back my time. <laughs> <laughs> I thank my colleagues. Uh, Mr. Waxman represents certainly a, a different point of view, and I appreciate his, his opening statement. But I would point out that we did take her, um, her suggestion about having a witness from Massachusetts, and we talked about it, and perhaps having a witness from Florida at another hearing. And I would, would say to my colleague uh, from California that perhaps we'll have another hearing on this oversight, and I agree. I'm pleased that you uh, support this uh, oversight on the stimulus uh, package, and I, in all deference to you, I don't re recollect any oversight hearing when the Democrats were in control on the stimulus package, so I'm very glad we can do it today. And uh, Mr. Green is recognized from Texas for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the one minute, and I appreciate our panel for being here. Uh, my concern is, is if we hadn't have spent that money, what would our employment unemployment be now? And I'll give you a great example in the Houston area. The Department of Energy provided eight, uh, $200 million for a smart metering program. Somebody had to make those meters and put those meters out there. Now, I have to admit I'm worried about uh, hearing from my constituents because historically we have smart metering. We find out that their bills go up, and nobody wants to hear that. But uh, maybe the technology is different. But that, that will help people control their electricity, and not only for their cost, but also for so we don't have to build more power plants. And, uh, but $200 million, I think, was one of the biggest grants that the Department of Energy gave to a local community. And, uh, and so, like I said, there are people working now to install those meters. And I wish they didn't lower the employment rate, but maybe our recession we had was much deeper and longer than most have expected. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to give it one minute. I thank my colleague. Does anyone else request a uh, speech? Gentleman I just, from the Virgin um, Islands. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I just want to speak a little to the success of the program in my district, as I'm sure it's been successful in many others. Uh, our Energy Star appliance rebate infused $800 $34,000 into the local economy through direct subsidies to 2,114 residents and small businesses. Our Sun Power Loan Program afforded 389 families to receive a solar water heater at no cost through a special program. The um, Hybrid and Electric Vehicle Rebate Program was, up when, was so successful that the rebates exceeded what they had planned. 81 rebates worth $259,200 and in addition to the direct and indirect jobs, we trained about 40 people who had been unemployed for a long time in solar water heater installation and repair. They're all going to work, and um, we're just really, um, this has been a great help to our economy, both in uh, reducing our uh, electricity bills and in creating jobs and saving jobs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank my colleague. Uh, now we come to our witnesses. Um, all of you are aware that the committee is holding an investigative hearing, and when do, doing so, it's been the practice of taking testimony under oath. Do you have any objection to testifying under oath? The chair then advised you that under the rules of the House and the rules of the committee, you are entitled to be advised by counsel. Do you desire to be advised by counsel during your testimony today? If not, if you please rise and raise your right hand, I will swear you in. Do you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? You are now under oath and subject to the penalties set forth in Title 18, Section 1001 of the United States Code. Before you give your five-minute summary, let me just introduce each of our witnesses today. Mr. Frank Franklin Rusco will testify on behalf of the Government Accountability Office He's a director on GAO's Natural Resources and Environmental Team. Welcome. Mr. Gregory H. Friedman, Inspector General at the Department of Energy, will also testify. He was confirmed by the Senate as Inspector General of DOE in 1998. He has been with the DOE Inspector General's Office since 1982. And finally, testifying on behalf of DOE is Steve Isakowitz, DOE Chief Financial Officer, and accompanying him will be several people that he might want to introduce. Uh, and so I welcome each of you. And if, before your opening statement, if you wanted to introduce some of your um, 
the staff that you have with you, that would be helpful. Uh, and we'll start with you, Mr. Uh, Rusco, for your opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I'm pleased to be here today to discuss GA. You might have to pull the mic just a little closer. Sorry. You have it on for sure, right? Yeah, it's on. Yeah. But can you hear? Okay. Okay, that's better. Thank you. I'm pleased to be here today to discuss GAO's oversight of DOE spending under the Recovery Act. The Recovery Act included almost $42 billion for the Department of Energy Programs, Activities, and Borrowing Authority. This Recovery Act money was spread over many DOE offices and programs, but the bulk of the money was concentrated in DOE's offices of energy efficiency and renewable energy, environmental management, electricity delivery and energy reliability, loan guarantees, fossil energy, and science. My remarks today are focused on five programs that received approximately 56 percent of DOE's Recovery Act funding. The Office of Environmental Management has for years overseen the cleanup of DOE's contaminated nuclear weapons research, development, and production facilities. This office received almost $6 billion in Recovery Act funds, a substantial increase in funding levels to the office, which has an annual budget of about $6 billion. The Weatherization Assistance Program has been providing home weatherization help to low-income households for over 30 years. The program received $5 billion in Recovery Act funding, a large increase compared to an annual budget of about $225 million. The Energy <coughs> Efficiency and Conservation Block Grants Program provides grants to states, territories, tribes, and localities to improve energy efficiency. This program was authorized in 2007, but the $3.2 billion it received in Recovery Act funding was the first funding ever for these block grants. The State Energy Program has, since 1996, provided grants to states, the District of Columbia, and territories to promote national energy goals such as increasing energy efficiency. This program, which typically has an annual budget of under $50 million, received $3.1 billion in Recovery Act funds. Finally, the Loan Guarantee Program was established in 2005 to provide federally guaranteed loans to energy projects that are innovative and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Until the Recovery Act, the Loan Guarantee Program had only been authorized to provide loans to companies who paid their own credit subsidy costs, an amount roughly equivalent to the expected loss to the government of the loan. In contrast, the Recovery Act provided $2.5 billion specifically to enable the program to pay the credit subsidy costs for projects. Because the government, instead of the borrower, pays the credit subsidy costs for loans made under the Recovery Act, this increases the amount of taxpayer money that is at risk considerably. The extent to which the Recovery Act funds provided to the five programs have been spent very significantly. As of March 10, 2011, DOE reported that 67 percent of Recovery Act funds for environmental management projects had been spent, 50 percent of funding for the weather assist Weatherization Assistance Program had been spent, 34 percent for the State Energy Program, 28 percent for Energy Efficiency and Conservation Block Grants, and 5 percent for the Loan Guarantee Program. The number of full-time equivalent jobs reported by recipients also varies by program. For example, the recipients of Weatherization Assistance Program funding reported 15,400 full-time equivalents jobs for the fourth quarter of 2010. Environmental management recipients reported 9,400 FTEs in the fourth quarter, and the Loan Guarantee Program reported 784 FTEs. In the course of our work, we found a variety of concerns. Overall, it has been difficult for DOE to build in effective measures for program goals, such as improving energy efficiency, energy saved, cost saved, cost effectiveness, or reduced environmental risk. In addition, DOE and funding recipients have struggled to accurately measure jobs funded by the Recovery Act. The Loan Guarantee prog Program has had difficulty reconciling the inherent tension between funding innovative projects that reduce greenhouse gas gases funding projects that have a high likelihood of paying back the loan, and in the case of Recovery Act funds, creating jobs in a timely fashion. GAO has made recommendations to DOE to improve the reporting and measurement of jobs funded by Recovery Act money 
to improve oversight and monitoring of Recovery Act funds and to improve the measurement and reporting of program outcomes. In most cases, DOE has generally agreed with our recommendations and has taken steps to implement them. Thank you. This concludes my oral statement. I will be happy to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Friedman, your opening statement. If you would just put the mic close in, make sure it's turned on. Yep. Mr. Chairman and members, <coughs> excuse me, members of the subcommittee, I appreciate the opportunity to testify today on the work of the Office of Inspector General concerning the Department of Energy's implementation of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009. I'm very pleased to be joined today by my colleague, my longtime colleague, Rick Haas, who is the Deputy Inspector General for Audits and Inspections. In March 2009, I testified before the Subcommittee on Investigations and Oversight Committee on Science and Technology on issues relating to the Recovery Act. In that hearing, I laid out the Office of Inspector General's strategy for ensuring the that the Recovery Act funds were used effectively and efficiently. Many of the findings I will discuss today parallel issues raised in my 2009 testimony. As you've heard and as you know, the Department received 35, a little over $35 billion under the Recovery Act for various science, energy, and environmental programs and initiatives. At of, at as of March 4, according to the Department's own records, it had obligated just over $33 billion or approximately 93 percent of these funds. However, of this amount, $12.3 billion had actually been spent. These funds were used to provide financial assistance awards to a variety of recipients and to accelerate the work of certain existing facilities management contractors. The Recovery Act called for intensive Inspector General oversight. Consequently, my office has pursued a strategy designed to prevent, hopefully, and de to detect inefficient, ineffective, and abusive Recovery Act expenditures. Since passage of the Act, we have issued 47 audit, inspection, and investigative reports covering activities that received about $26 billion in Recovery Act funding. These e efforts identified weaknesses in the management administration of contracts and financial assistance awards. In the case of the Department's $5 billion weatherization program, our work also revealed the need to resolve health and safety issues, some of which could have endangered low-income recipients of services. Further, we initiated over 80 Recovery Act-related criminal investigations these investigations were predicated on alleged schemes such as fraudulent, fraudulent claims, claims for rebates and mischarging for services. To date, they have resulted in two criminal prosecutions and over $1 million in recoveries. In addition, 20 percent of the remaining Recovery Act cases have thus far, far been accepted for prosecutorial action. And we provided 258 fraud awareness briefings for nearly 15,000 federal, contractors, state and other officials. These briefings alerted responsible officials to poss possible fraud schemes and in so doing, we hope, serve to prevent abusive Recovery Act expenditures. Department officials have told us that these efforts have helped improve the management of Recovery Act programs. My full testimony provides additional details regarding our work, including a listing of the relevant Inspector General reports. As you know, are no doubt aware, the Department of Energy was one of the largest recipients of Recovery Act funding in the federal government. This additional funding allowed the Department to expand long-standing programs such as the Residential Weatherization Program and create new initiatives including the Energy Efficiency and Community Block Grant Program. The goals of the Recovery Act were to be accomplished expeditiously so as to stimulate the economy and create jobs, all in an atmosphere of transparency and accountability. The Department, in our view, responded with a robust, good-faith effort to implement and execute the various aspects of the Recovery Act. Through our work, we have identified a number of overarching issues and lessons learned that should be considered if similar programs are proposed. First, the demanding nature of the Recovery Act's implementation placed an enormous strain on the Department's then existing infrastructure. Secondly, dealing with a diverse and complex set of de departmental stakeholders complicated Recovery Act startup and administration. Third, although shovel-ready projects were the symbolic goal of the Recovery Act, reflecting the desire to expeditiously create jobs, in most cases, execution was more challenging and time-consuming than had been anticipated. Fourth, infrastructure at the state and local levels, levels was overwhelmed. Ironically, in several states, those charged with implementing the Act's provisions had been furloughed due to economic conditions in those very states. Fifth, the pace of actual expenditures was significantly slowed because of the time needed to understand and address specific requirements of the Recovery Act. And finally, in the initial phase, recipients of Recovery Act funding expressed their frustration with what they described as overly complex, complicated, and burdensome reporting requirements. In summary, 
massive funding, high expectations, and inadequate infrastructure resulted at times, and I stress at times, in less than optimal performance. Large portions of the funds allocated to the Recovery Act have yet to been spent. Accordingly, we continue to focus our attention on Recovery Act programs, including currently an evaluation of contingency plans to address transitioning to a post-Recovery Act funding posture, and our investigative efforts continue. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my formal statement. I'd please to be pleased to answer any questions that you or other members of the subcommittee may have. Uh, our next uh, witness is uh, Mr. Steve Sokowitz, and if you don't mind just introducing uh, the people that are with you. I just wonder, is your mic turned on? It, it is? Okay, maybe just bring it a little closer to you. Thanks. As part of our comprehensive risk management effort, we have also worked hard to identify those recipients that might require help monitoring and closure plans. We currently have this year 4,000 individuals as part of the Office of Risk Management, 12,000 sub recipients, including these with highly private oversight and financial capacity. Our risk scoring methodology. visits for these programs. 
Audits and inspections conducted by the DOE, IG, and GAO are an integral part of the Department's monitoring and oversight efforts, and we are committed to working with the IG and GAO to facilitate their work and address any issues they identify. For example, we have given IG and GAO staff direct access to all content in our iPortal and provided training on using the system. To date, the IG has issued 47 reports related to the Recovery Act implementation. For 16, the IG did not identify any issues significant enough to warrant recommendations for management action. For the other reports, the IG issued 111 separate recommendations, and the Department has already resolved 50 percent of these. Costs questioned by the IG represent only 0.03 percent of the Department's Recovery Act spending authority. The IG has, the GAO has issued 10 reports, three of which contain recommendations for management action, which we will actively, uh, are actively addressing. Mr. Chairman, I would like to thank you again for inviting me to testify about the Department's efforts under the Recovery Act. The Department was charged to ensure that the money is spent quickly and spent well. We take this responsibility seriously. I look forward to responding to your questions, and I would like to introduce two of my colleagues who will help me in doing so. Inez Trier <coughs> is the Assistant Secretary for Environmental Management, and Steve Chalk, the Chief Operating Officer for the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. Thank you. I thank Mr. Sokowitz. Do you mind introduce the two people that you have with you? Yes, oh, you just did. Okay, excuse <laughs> me. Okay, sorry. Um, you seem to uh, be very uh, uh, high on the program and uh, indicate that uh, you've tried to implement most of the GAO Inspector General's recommendation. Is that what you're saying? Yes, we've moved it exp expeditiously as we can. Yeah. Um, I think. When you look at the program, here we are two years after the program was signed, the stimulus package was signed, and if I would pertain to the weatherization program, it's still only about a halfway to meeting its target. And I think Mr. Rusco and Mr. Friedman, isn't it fair to say that the states and the Department of Energy were not prepared to implement uh, this plan in a way that uh, satisfied what most of us thought the stimulus bill would do, and provide immediate injection to the economy and jobs for the unemployed, uh, Mr. Rusco? Well, there were a number of issues early on that <clears throat> slowed the implementation of this program, and among them were uh, the Dave Davis-Bacon requirements um, that, that required the Department of Labor. So the Davis-Bacon Act slowed down the actual implementation of the plan, particularly with weatherization. Is that correct? Yes, it did. It, it, it required the Department of, the Lab of Labor to establish rates for weatherization workers in, in localities, and they eventually did that in September of 2009. Okay. Mr. Friedman? Uh, I, I would agree with that, Mr. Chairman. If, if you allow me a per moment of personal privilege, if you don't mind. Sure. Mr. Azakowicz is a good friend of mine, but I just want to point out for the record that it took the IG to show him how to turn on his microphone. Oh, okay. That's good. <laughs> That's good. We were glad to see the Energy Department knew how to flip a switch. <laughs> Saving energy. Um, I have here uh, cases, uh, particularly in Tennessee, dealing with weatherization, which shows some gross uh, mismanagement where they came in to put uh, uh, insulation in, and all they did is put the bag of insulation. I'll be glad to show this to you. Uh, actually, we're, they were supposed to weather, weatherize the home uh, through the windows and uh, through the attic, and all they did was paint the house, and I have numerous examples here. So I think the question is, for you, Mr. Sokowitz, uh, what uh, measures did you take to ensure the quality of the weatherization was not, uh, uh, you know, sacrifice and, uh, for deadlines, and, and actually did you have some kind of uh, measuring techniques? Because I'd be glad to show you these uh, egregious examples where uh, – the work was not done. In fact, um, during our preliminary analysis of the 440 homes review, we found deficiencies with 233 of these, 52 percent, and the work was not even performed in about 45 percent of these homes. I'll be glad to give you this information. So I guess the question we have here is what kind of measuring techniques did you have? Because I think the GAO, Mr. Roscoe, indicated earlier that uh, he mentioned his opening statement that it did not use new good measuring uh, techniques for the jobs that were implemented. I'm going to turn to Mr. Chalk to act, uh, answer the specifics to your question, but let me just say generally, the way we treated this program is the way we treated all the programs when we got started on the Recovery Act. It has been mentioned a number of times, this was significant funding and new funding for the department. 
particularly for the state programs. Um, many times this represented anywhere from 20 to 60 times more funding than we get on an annual basis. In the case of the block grant, it was a brand new program. So one of the things that we did up front for this program and the others is to, before we started spending money, to make sure we had the necessary controls in place and worked in, with the states who are going to be the recipients of an unprecedented amount of, of funding up front to make sure that they were able to handle it. As to the specifics of your question. Be before you do that, just case, based upon what you said, I think I would take it on face value that you're saying that to create a stimulus package through the weatherization program, this is not the best way to do it because you had to ramp up so much. When I see what you were dealing with annually, uh, the program I think was preparing about 100,000 annually, but the stimulus increased it almost to 600,000 uh, over a three-year period. So I think you're implying that you had to ramp up and perhaps all that ramp up made it more difficult for you. Maybe the stimulus through this weatherization ramp up is not the best way to create a stimulus. Would you agree with that? No, we, we think it actually has been a, a very effective program, and we think the program impact we've received as a result has shown that it has been very effective in saving average Americans uh, in low-income homes of significant funds. Uh, how, how would you measure that? I mean, well, w if we I mean, look what, at uh, what uh, measurement were you using to de determine and validate what you just said? Well, well, just broadly speaking, I mean, for low-income homes, energy costs are usually 15 percent of oftentimes what they have to pay, where an average American, it might so be. So you just broadly speaking on your own. Your well, I'm own. just saying, sp speaking for just in terms of the value of this program back, and in terms of actually homes that we have touched, we have already uh, done 300,000 Do you think this should create sustainable uh, jobs after that? Well, uh, in many cases, we are creating the kind of skills that as we uh, move in our entire economy to a more energy efficient economy, many of the skills that are being applied for these homes are the same kind of skills that could be applied. But if they're not creating more work afterwards, if there's not work afterwards, then, then they'll suddenly stop and they won't have any more work. But anyway, Mr. Chalk, why don't you finish so I don't go too far? Yeah, if I may, I'll address a couple issues. One is the late start, the challenges that have been mentioned. Through the Davis-Bacon With new requirements on the program that weren't with the legacy program. It was an increase about 25-fold in terms of the size of the program. Uh, but the program was, was uh, st always structured to be done within three years of the Recovery Act. So even though we got a late start, we're on schedule, and we're scheduled for just about every state, every territory, every tribe to be completed in March of 12, March 2012, three years after the Recovery Act was initiated. So. Over the last year, we've been running at about 20 to 30,000 homes per month, doing three, about 300,000 homes a year. So we have really accelerated the program. Initially, we had some workmanship problems, and there's been references to Tennessee and Illinois. So, we, so you're familiar with the Tennessee, all the cases I, I've got? I'm not personally familiar with Tennessee, but we've had workmanship uh, issues in the onset of the program. I need you to wrap up just because my time's expired. And, and essentially the way that we're handling that is uh, a significant 20 percent of the funding was for training and technical assistance. We have a massive training, uh, about two dozen training centers. We're training the contractors, we're tra training the sub-recipients who are monitoring the work. Our state folks now are actually measuring the 5 percent of the homes by sample. And uh, the DOE has about uh, two dozen monitors that go out regularly and oversee the work. So we have several layers of oversight to make sure that the, the improvement measures are being instituted, the right ones, yeah. and that usually is not windows. It's usually insulation, caulking. I'm going to let you wrap up things the, like that. the ranking member. And we have, uh, to, I think what we have now is, is working very well, and we are uh, producing quality home weatherization. All right. My time's expired. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Friedman, um, uh, the Recovery Act contained quite a bit of um, money for oversight and investigation to try to uh, eliminate um, fraud and other kinds of misuse of the funds, correct? That's correct. Can you explain to this committee very briefly what kinds of resources were available to the DOE ins Inspector General under the era? Yes, as I recall the <laughs> precise number, uh, Mr. Gaddett, it was uh, $15 million. With those funds, we have taken the following approach. One is we uh, hired temporary employees to, to augment our, our staff specifically focused on areas where we thought the, the most vulnerabilities, the most vulnerable aspects of, of, of the program. And you've done about 47 reports and audits on ERA funding to date, correct? That's correct. 
Yes. And um, uh, Mr. Rusko, I wonder if you can tell us about the resources and responsibility given to GAO under the Recovery Act. Uh, yes, GAO received uh, $25 million to um, oversee the Recovery Act. Uh, with that money, we hired uh, a largely uh, retired annuitants back into the to the uh, fold to help us with this work, but we also used a lot of uh, our other resources in this. We focused on state programs primarily, and we reported on a bi-monthly basis typically. And, and you, you uh, issued 107 reports, correct? I, I'll take your word okay. for it. It, it was <laughs> a lot. <laughs> um, now, now uh, Mr. Zakowitz, I, um, I would assume that you're not trying to imply when you say you had to ramp up quickly that there's any view that we shouldn't have quickly tried to implement this program, correct? No, we, we think this is a great program and it has great results and we've had and, a and, lot of and, and let me ask you this, do you think that the fact that you had to ramp up quickly um, meant that there was a disproportionate um, amount of poor work or, or improper use of the funds or anything like that? Uh, no. In fact, we have been very careful and as we've ramped up to make sure we had all the internal controls, the accountability and transparency in place. Now, what about situations like this shoddy work in Tennessee that the chairman was talking about? Well, uh, it, is a, it, it is a vast undertaking and when you have as many homes as we've had to d deal with, and again, we've had over 300,000, clearly you're going to have cases of issues that have come out. That's why it was very important up front that before these dollars went out that we went and visited all 50 states to actually work with them to set up controls to make sure that, in fact, they had the appropriate mechanisms in place to take care. And we have a very exacting, exacting monitoring process where we track and look for issues. In fact, uh, very often we'll work closely with the states and the IGA and GAO to try to identify these problems before they become big so, problems. So what you're saying is you feel, you feel like while there are, are problems like this, which certainly none of us would want to see problems like that, you're feeling like it's because of the, of the uh, programs you put in place, it's not endemic throughout the system. That's correct. We'd love to be perfect. And, and what about uh, Mr. Rusko, Mr. Friedman, would you agree with that statement? That it's not endemic, that these problems aren't endemic throughout the system? Well, first of all, one of the first things we, we did, Ms. DeGettin, in 2000, early 2009 was issue a lessons learned report in which we looked back on the work that we had done the prior couple of years and determined whether there were lessons we could learn from what had been experienced in the past, including in weatherization. I, I would and did you learn lessons? Well, we <laughs> did we learn lessons? Yes, I think yeah. we did. And it, it was a, a teaching moment for us as to how to use our resources to, to, to uh, address the most pressing problems. Okay. Mr. Rusko, anything to add? I guess I would say it's a, a mixed bag. There, there are uh, problems identified in, in our reports that uh, DOE has begun to implement and, and um, respond to. Uh, there, we continue to do work and we continue to have findings um, where we will be reporting um, in a couple of months on the uh, energy efficiency and conservation block grants. Okay. I think, Mr. Chairman, that might be a good opportunity to have that other hearing you were talking about. They're coming up with another report in a couple of months. So um, let, me, let me ask you, Mr. Rusko, um, you, you said one of the reasons for the um, uh, slow start to, to starting to these programs was Davis-Bacon. That's the law that says you have to be pay prevailing wages in these areas, correct? That is correct. So, we, so it, say in Tennessee, if you're going going in and, and adopting weatherization programs or something, you ha you can't undercut the local wages, right? Yes. Uh, that would seem to me to make sense given given what we're trying to do with the era money, which is to promote the job market. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlelady. Uh, the gentleman from Oklahoma is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Rusko, um, GAO has completed two reports on the loan guarantee program. Is that correct? Uh, I think it's three now, yes. So it's three programs. No, three, three reports, I'm sorry. Oh, three reports? Okay. The most recent report was issued July uh, 2010. Is that correct? Correct. As you know, the Loan Guarantee Program is currently the subject of an investigation by this subcommittee, in particular a loan guarantee to a California company named Solyndra. So I don't want to get into the particulars over certain guarantees at this point. Instead, I want to discuss the program generally. 
The first Recovery Act related guarantee was announced in March 2009. Is that correct, sir? I believe that's correct, yes. And that was to Solyndra, a California company. Is that correct? Yes. And that was a, was that a $535 million loan they got? Yes, it was. Okay. Since then, DOE has announced 15 other loan guarantees for companies engaging or planning to engage in, in producing innovative energy technologies. Is that correct, sir? Uh, they've issued now 10, and they have another, um, I'm not sure exactly how many that are con conditional loans, okay. but an additional number. Aside for, from Solyndra, what is the status of the other 14 companies who received loan guarantees? Where are they in developing these projects? Well, there, there are um, three other companies that have gotten loans that have uh, identified and, and um, uh, submitted job information. So there are a total of four out of the ten loans that have actually been issued that where, where uh, development has been. Have any of these companies under consideration by you uh, even broken ground yet? The four have, and, four have. and Solyndra is uh, – far along if not finished with the plant that it that uh, it was built. Of the 10 closed loans, only three have begun construction, uh, and, and you say there may be some other activity. Th that, that's what I believe, yes. Okay. Uh, Mr. Um, Zakowitz, is that how you say it? Mr. Zakowitz, of the, perp uh, the pur uh, purposes of the stimulus was, uh, uh, was to create jobs, as they were everyone saying, right? Is that right? That's correct. And the loan program's website shows the number of jobs that each loan guarantee is supposedly creating. Is that right, sir? That's correct. So the job numbers shown on the website, can they be considered created before the facilities have broken ground? Well, it's important to note how we go about collecting the information. They, they put the numbers in, the recipients of those dollars, based upon dollars by which we have obligated. In, in many cases, some of these uh, applicants would, in fact, start to break ground and create some of the jobs prior to it. So what we receive and what we report is what the recipients give us based upon those that we close. But they, they were considered before they even broke ground. Some of them were, though, right? Yeah, I can't speak to okay. it, it. It happens usually when, they, when they're breaking ground. Okay. Um, also, Mr. Resco, um, in, in July 2010 report, you state that the DOE Loan Programs Office had not developed sufficient performance goals to measure the actual results of the loan guarantees against the planned or desired results. Why is this significant? Well, with any program, we'd like to be able to go back uh, over time and see how they're doing in achieving their goals. And among the goals for the loan guarantee program was to um, cre create funding for innovative uh, uh, projects, energy projects that reduce greenhouse gas emissions that also have a high probability of paying back the loan. And under the job, uh, the, recover or the Recovery Act funding, also the, uh, one of the goals was to create jobs. Well, Mr. Resco, is the Loan Guarantee Program Office making any effort to determine whether the loan guarantees it grants are actually resulting in greater energy efficiencies or infrastructure improvements? Yes or no? They may be taking steps to do so. We're not satisfied with the steps, and they have not agreed with most of our recommendations. So that'd be no. Kind of no. <laughs> Sounds like no. <laughs> Mr. Zakowitz, um, the GAO report, DOE states that we will revisit the performance goals. Has DOE done so? Uh, I'd have to get back to you on that. What's, excuse I'd me? I'd have to get back to you on that. Could, could, could you submit that uh, we will. for the record? Uh, what are the performance, what are the performance goals? Um, some of the generals I can speak of, and again, I'd have to get you the, the, the detail for the record, but uh, generally we have looked at um, the, the impact we have in terms of uh, our focus on clean energy, in terms of CO2 sequestration, and on issues on, on some of the jobs created. Does the loan uh, program office plan to go back and determine the actual results of these loans? Uh, yes, we, 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 we monitor it. In fact, uh, when we close the loan, we don't step away from the loan. In fact, we, we are staying very close to the loans throughout the whole repayment of the loan itself. Uh, Mr. Zakowitz, if the DOE does not close a number of the loans soon, it would stand to lose its unspent stimulus money, or $2 billion right now, I believe. Is that right? Uh, we have $2 billion of, of unobligated funds. And you're going to try to get that out the door pretty quick? We, we have the demand to get it out the door, okay. yes. Okay. And the office would need to close these loans soon, right, in order for the companies to meet the construction deadlines. Is that correct? 
and we have queued it up just for that. Yes. Does the loan uh, program's office intend to spend all of this $2 billion? And if so, by what date would it need to do so? Uh, yes, we intend to, and we need to do it by the statutory date, which is at the end of September. Okay. Uh, Mr. Resco, are you concerned by this situation? Well, we do have concerns about about the internal controls of the program. We have in every report um, issued recommendations to improve controls over oh, and performance measures for the program. So there is some concern about uh, if the program were to ramp up the the speed of issuing loans, we would like to see those controls in place. So, Mr. Resco, you're still concerned about about this, aren't you? The situation, how they measure it. We're working on we're working on uh, uh, our fourth report right now, and gentleman's time has expired. Continuing to find uh, issues that we're concerned about. Yes. Thank you, sir. Gentlelady is recognized, Virgin Island, Ms. Christensen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and, and welcome to all of the people on the panel. Um, today we've heard from DOE that the funds provided by the Recovery Act help the department and its state, local, and private grantees create tens of thousands of new jobs. In just the last quarter, those grantees reported supporting employment for 43,000 workers, and those numbers are quite laudable, but they may understate actually the impact of DOE's Recovery Act funding. For instance, I know that DOE has always relied heavily on both contractors and subcontractors to carry out its mission. Yet, as the DOE uh, IG noted in an April 2010 audit report, many of the prime contractors reporting Recovery Act hiring to the department failed to report any of the job creation that occurred at the subcontractor level. So, um, Mr. Friedman, uh, is that correct? That is correct. I, I, if I may, uh, Ms. Christensen, I not, not take exception to it, but I'm, your characterization may be a little different. Mm -hmm. uh, according to the rules that have been established uh, from the beginning, a subcontractor job creation was not to be included in the report. So that, uh, so in fairness, uh, at some point, of course, they, they changed, the rules did change, but that was the going in posture, which we felt was uh, understated the job creation capability of the money that, that had been spent. Okay, so even though it, it wasn't absolutely required initially, um, the fact that subcontractors may not have reported may understate the number of jobs because it's my understanding uh, from the same report that perhaps the subcontractors, the jobs created by them was nearly double that by the prime contractors. That's, that's one of the interesting aspects that uh, we discovered, which was that, uh, that uh, job creation at the subcontractor level may have far exceeded that at the contractor level. So I, I agree with your fundamental point. And, and so you agree that we may have significantly underestimated the impact of the Recovery Act spending S on employment? Certainly as far as that, that category of spending is concerned at that time. Okay, and I know that calculating the exact number of jobs created by the federal spending can be complicated. Some people suggest that this sort of spending might be crowding out private sector employment or bringing jobs into the present that would have been created in the future. So setting aside the validity of those concerns uh, in a time of full employment, Mr. Rusko, are we worried that DOE job creation has been crowding out private sector hiring during the recession? It varies depending on the economic conditions in any locality, but in a time when there's high unemployment and economic activity is very low, we're in a recession, there's much less concern for crowding out than there would be if we were at a point of full employment. Okay, so during a recession, there's a benefit to turning potential future jobs into present jobs, is that right? That's. That's something I really can't comment on. I, uh, it's a, that, that's a, a choice. Okay. And finally, Mr. Isakowitz, do the job numbers we've talked about capture all of the economic benefit of the Department's Recovery Act spending, or did that spending benefit Americans in other ways as well? Uh, I, I think that's correct. Um, as Mr. Friedman pointed out, that in addition to the subcontracts, the way the numbers are co uh, collected is that there's two people working half-time on it, that's, that's treated as one person. 
It also doesn't include the, those uh, that we call the, the induced and the indirect, like for those who, let's say, might be a, a vendor carrying goods across country would not be counted, and as well as the impact on the local economy to, let's say, local restaurants and so on, those are not counted. And then, and again, a, a lot of what we're investing in is, in, in fact, an investment in the long term. So, in right. fact, when our dollars stop from any of these activities, we hope it will stimulate local opportunities for small businesses to, in fact, in fact, we spent almost $10 billion of the Recovery Act on small businesses that we think would, would enable a more vibrant economy than had we not been there. And then you have the um, average savings for homes that have been weatherized and, and, other, and other benefits. And I remember Dr. Ch Chu speaking speaking just as he became secretary about maybe the lack of a strong record of grant management and so and trained staff at the department. But it sounds as though from what you've had to do uh, to prepare for the spending and the monitoring that the department is probably in much better shape going forward. So there's an ad additional benefit to the Department of Energy, isn't there? Yes. In fact, we've, we've demonstrated a number of best practices that one of my focuses now going forward is to make sure that our ongoing programs, in fact, benefit from exactly that. Okay. I, um, we have a situation in the Virgin Islands where um, perhaps one of the programs is oversubscribed and, and, and others uh, where our government has passed legislation determining, for example, that solo water heaters must be in, in new homes for 70 percent of the hot water and uh, rebates allow should be allowable up to 50 percent. Is there any flexibility or a possibility of, a, a, say, for those programs that are oversubscribed from moving money from one area into the General other? And lady's time has expired. You're certainly welcome to answer answer her question. Within uh, the state energy program and within the block program, block grant program, we can uh, uh, revise activities as long as there's money left and then uh, do some of the things that have been oversubscribed and we have to cut things that have been undersubscribed or you don't want to do any longer. Thank you. The, Thank uh, you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Murphy, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you. This is questions for Mr. Zakowitz and uh, Mr. Chalk. Uh, as you review programs within Department of Energy, um, how do you assess if a federal program that's operating now is working efficiently and effectively and it's worth keeping money in it versus one that you're going to reduce money in that. Can either one of you give me an idea? Sure. I'll just talk more broadly. Um, what we've d done up front is we uh, had identified these project plans where we identify specific metrics of what we wanted each program to achieve. In addition, we identified areas of risk. We also identified particular milestones in terms of when they would be delivering. And we had set up a, a system doing, due to the unprecedented effort we had in transparency to actually collect this information. Uh, we have regular what we call deep dive reviews where we go over in great detail how we're doing, is the recipient delivering it as promised, and areas that we see are running into issues. We work with the recipient to see how it is that we... Recipients of the grants, for example? Yes, recipients okay. of grants or contracts to make sure that they remain on track. Well, that we, so of course we've heard that some of these... Um, uh, some of the DOE monies of the $33 billion having trouble allocating that out or obligating or releasing it. Um, of course, one of the promises made by the administration is that they could rapidly disperse these funds. Uh, I want to see if we can uh, look at a particular agency within the Department of Energy that executes its responsibilities from what I understand is in a timely and efficient manner, which I think would meet those standards. Uh, specifically, it's my understanding that the National Energy Technology Laboratories, or NETL, uh, obligated all of its stimulus dollars. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And I understand it, they did that pretty effectively under, on time, on budget, um, without fraud or any uh, durable things. Am I correct at that, too? Yeah. I mean, I want to give commendation only to Nettle, but a, a lot of the rest of the organization, in fact, we sure. were able to obligate 99.9 percent .9 at the prescribed deadline. Okay. So um, basically, they, they did a good job dispersing those funds, and I'm yes, pleased I represent some of it. Now, I'm concerned about something, and perhaps you can help me with this. I'm concerned there seems to be an effort in the President's uh, 2012 budget that's going to transfer operations or programs like um, having experts out in the field into Washington, D.C. In particular, when I look at the EERE presidential request of $3.23 billion, it's a 37 percent increase over 2011 uh, presidential request. Uh, and yet I see Nettle is projected to receive $14.9 million. It's a 10 $0.6 million reduction, which would be about a 50 percent reduction to federal staff within Nettle. 
my, my concern is here's a, a program that has done a job on time, on budget, without fraud or abuse, and yet it, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe I'm misreading this, but it looks like money is pulling away from there, expanding into another area. Is this, does this indicate this program is going to be uh, reducing its funding and its mission? The, uh, the re reduction in uh, program direction or FTEs and NETL is really uh, symbolic of the decrease in Workload Recovery Act. So it, it peaked uh, over the last two years and then in FY12 when most of the procurements and, and so forth are completed, it's dropping back to the FTE level that it saw prior to the Recovery Act. Do we have, but we still have some funds that are yet to be dispersed and where will those be? All funds are uh, dispersed. Dispersed now. Well, are there other functions within NETL that you're looking to move, uh, pull out and move into Washington, D.C.? We're uh, constantly looking at optimal program management, whether something should be done in the field mm -hmm. or at headquarters. So that's under constant evaluation <laughs> every year as we prepare for the budget. Within this, too, when the President gave a State of Union address, he also talked about clean coal. And I commented to him as he's walking up the aisle, we're, I'm pleased about that. Every inch of my district is over coal and natural gas. Uh, do you see us moving forward on some funding that uh, programs like NETL, which in the past have played a, a good role in research, et cetera, in, in uh, uh, a coal-related research, will those continue to be worked and funded and um, maintained? Uh, yeah, we, we, we had in the President's 2011 request, and we'll see where things come up, but we had important investments to make, in fact, in fossil energy, and we'll continue to make impo important R&D investments. Um, when you heard the President and the Secretary speak about the need for a, a, a broad effort in clean energy, uh, clearly coal, clean coal particularly, and carbon capture and sequestration is a key part of that. So we, we've maintained our investment, and in fact, the Recovery Act has been very critical, in fact, to demonstrate the very technologies that are important for the future. I'd be glad to uh, talk with you more and see how we can support this in the future, too. I know it's important to have headquarters like that in the middle of coal country, and I know that NETL that is in both Pennsylvania and West Virginia is certainly the heart of everything there, and a lot of great workers who have spent their careers and the long legacy of that across many administrations. I hope that we can continue to look at programs that have been very efficient and effective in that, and I'll be glad to work with you and see how we can help on that together. We'd be happy to work with you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me briefly uh, talk about prevailing wage or Davis-Bacon. In my part of the country, they call it prevailing wage. Uh, part of the Recovery Act also required to hire local uh, workers or local folks uh, that if you had the skills in the local area to do the work. And I know uh, not only was it Davis-Bacon, but prevailing wage. And, you know, that's been part of federal law and construction projects as long as I can remember. Is that generally true of our witnesses? Uh, prevailing wages? I'm sorry, I, I don't know the full scope of where the Davis-Bacon Act is. Uh, oh, okay. Applied. Well, maybe it's new to the Department of Energy because in other construction projects it's not new. It's been around, I think, since the 30s. And In fact, we've had some votes on the House floor in the last 15 years trying to remove it, and it typically always wins on a, uh, uh, not to remove it on a bipartisan basis. Um, let me... Uh, and so I don't know if that got in the way as much because that's required on a lot of federal projects that they do all over the country. Let me ask you about uh, some of the concerns about the uh, DOE program. H.R. Uh, 1 that we had uh, and will continue since we have a three-week uh, continuing resolution cuts the budget Office of Energy Efficiency by 35 uh, percent from over $2.2 billion to $1.5 and prevents DOE from spending money for weatherization state energy programs. Could you discuss the consequences of the cuts? What's it going to do to both state energy programs, but also to, uh, uh, to home weatherization? And I know it's benefited in a lot of our districts. Yes, it, eliminating the weatherization program is going to be devastating. As I said earlier, it's been uh, a tremendous effort to get the program back on schedule. We're supposed to be completed uh, in, in March of 12. And uh, if without 11 appropriations, and there's a, there's a tremendous lead time that's required, we need FY11 appropriations because this is kind of a cash business, weatherization. Materials need to be bought uh, prior to uh, the production year that the states have, which is usually right in the middle of our fiscal year. So, it doesn't, so it's a little complicated. But if we don't get the FY11 uh, funding, we're in jeopardy of, 
furloughing about 8,000 people. We'll have 34,000 homes that won't be weatherized. And again, uh, the, the investment ratio here is for every dollar that the federal government puts in, there's about $1.80 of savings out. And this has been well-founded over the years. Um, so we'll lose that uh, savings for low-income people who, again, they pay a disproportionate amount of their income on energy bills, about five times what uh, non-low-income people pay. So this will be pretty devastating to the, to the, the, the weatherization network as well as the low-income families. We jeopardize losing our training centers, which recognizing some of the startup and workmanship <coughs> issues. Most of those are behind us. Tennessee, for instance, is doing very well. We rate every state on how well they do in monitoring. Tennessee scored very well in our last site visit for monitoring. So we feel things are very much on track. And uh, 42 out of our 59 eight, our states and territories and Indian tribes, 42 out of 59 will be totally out of money in the middle of uh, FY12 with their annual money and their Recovery Act money. So if, if the F FY11 money does not come, then we see significant consequences of uh, essentially a cliff where work just stops. We lose the, the infrastructure related to training, certifying inspectors, and training uh, the actual contractors to do the work. It, my understanding about 300,000 homes thus far has been weatherized using Recovery Act funds? Well, if you include the January numbers, it's about 350,000. So we're past the halfway point. Okay. And I'm real familiar with the training centers. I have one in our district. Of course, my folks from up north wonder why would we weatherize in Texas, but come to Texas between May and September, and you'll know why we need to weatherize because we, uh, it gets pretty warm there. Uh, about the state efficiency programs, uh, I know I don't have a few seconds. State offices use DOE funds to leverage investments and uh, for efficiency upgrades. I understand it's estimated for every 50 million in state edu uh, energy program funding, it produces 333 million in annual energy savings costs and leverages another 585 million for energy-related economic development. Is that number true? I'd have to get back to the record on that number, but I would say that the state energy program as well as the energy efficiency block grant program really are reinvesting for the future. They're, they're more long-term payoff than we typically think the Recovery Act is immediate stimulus like weatherization and the environmental restoration that we're doing. These programs that you're mentioning do have tremendous life, life, life cycle savings and are really uh, programs investing in the future. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman's time expired. Uh, gentleman from Texas, Mr. Burgess, Dr. Burgess. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Rusko and Mr. Friedman, and again, I apologize also for being out of the room for part of your testimony today. And if I'm asking you something that has already been covered, just please indulge me and don't embarrass me by pointing it out. Um, on the loan programs, the loan office program, it's not a huge sum of money by, by Washington standards, but still a big bunch of money, $2.5 billion. Is that about right? That's correct. So... This office is currently the subject of some investigations within this committee, and it is the object of some interest by yourselves. Is that correct? Yes, we're currently doing a review of, uh, uh, of the program. Now, <clears throat> I think one of the things that's raised some concern is that the loan program's office issued a loan guarantee to one company prior to receiving a single report from the external reviewers whose job it was to evaluate the soundness of the loan guarantee. I believe that uh, they issued a conditional commitment prior to uh, receiving a final um, financial or market marketing report and then issued the loan before having completed a, a le I'm sorry, a legal, uh, a legal report. Now, there's a, there's a time commitment to money <coughs> to be received under this program that uh, the construction on the projects must begin by September of this year, is that correct? That's correct. Are you concerned that any other loans might be, might be fast-tracked in the same nature? Our concerns are broadly about, about the way the program has been set up, both to um, 
follow a consistent and and um, rigorous due diligence process to make sure that that before they issue loans that they they have fully gone through their process and and have fully vetted all the all the issues that they have that the program has identified as important and we found in our last report that for a number of loans that went to conditional <coughs> commitment they had not finished all the steps of their due diligence proce process well is there is there any pressure oh no, pressure is not quite the right word but uh, you can imagine if the program if you got to be submitted and and, and and constructing by September that that's a fairly condensed timeline six months from now is that condensation of the timeline is that putting any additional pressure to bear on that I, I can't speak to exactly where the program is in terms of the process of all the existing loan applications I can say that that the pace at which they have been able to issue loans up to date would if that pace were to continue they would definitely not make it and then what would happen those loans would just go away or be reclaimed by the Department of Energy or by the Federal Treasury I what? believe they go back to the Federal Treasury okay uh, Mr. Sokowitz um, is it appropriate that this committee is concerned about the loans program office putting taxpayer dollars at risk by guaranteeing loans without doing the due diligence first? First, I want to be really clear. We, we have set up a very exacting process of due diligence as we go through it. Uh, I think the report that you're referring back to was from about nine months ago. Um, we, we did not agree with the, that particular finding. <coughs> uh, just to be clear, there, there's a major difference between what we call a conditional commitment and a closing. A closing is the key milestone. That, that is when we are committing and obligating the funds for that particular project. At a conditional commitment, we have just identified the issues that we expect the applicant to address before we close. So I believe in that particular report, what they raised was some issues that some of the reports were not fully in hand at the time of the conditional commitment. But we understood that at the time, and it was able, we were able to address that, ris that risk sufficiently so that we, we had told the recipient that before we close on the loan, all the required reports needed to be in. So we were, were not cutting any corners to get to closing. What about now this abbreviated timeline between now and September? Does that put additional pressure on the, on the program? Well, we, we've had the opportunity to either close or get to conditional commitments on, on 16 projects, and we have greatly improved the timeline without cutting any corners in terms of, of getting to it. Uh, we, we have actually staffed up accordingly. Two years ago, we had maybe 10 <coughs> or 15 people in the office. Today, we have over 100. So, in fact, we have put the processes in place to address the, the demand that we see in terms of uh, getting to those yeah. funds by the end of the fiscal year. Let, let me just pose a question to the Inspector General. Um, so we're told that this is kind of not a big deal, these are trivial. Um, what's your response? Do you, do you feel that this is a misplaced concern on the part of the committee? Well, to put it in some perspective, uh, Dr. Burgess, the, essentially the, the authority under the Loan Guarantee Program is $71 billion. So there's a significant amount of money at risk. I, I can't address the particular specific issues that you're raising, but it's obviously for that reason it both deserves the attention of the department and the, the attention of all the oversight bodies to make sure that the taxpayers' uh, are risks are as protected to the extent possible. Oft obviously, you wouldn't need a government guarantee if there was no risk. So they are they are inherently there is some element of risk inherent in these programs. So uh, I think your your uh, probing is, is appropriate, uh, and, and that's basically all I guess I, all I can add. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, the gentlemen. Uh, we're going to allow Mr. Garner to finish up, and then we're going to close the hearing. I think we've had uh, good timing with the votes. I just would like to ask for a uh, unanimous request, a consent request, to place an audit report from Tennessee and the Department of Energy IG report into the record. Hearing no objection, so ordered. Uh, Mr. Garner, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The witness is here today. Uh, just a couple of quick questions for Mr. Friedman. Uh, in one of your audit reports, you stated the state resources. State resources have been significantly strained due uh, to the administration of DOE stimulus dollars. Is that is that correct? Uh, that's correct. And, and without meaning to be t too clever, we've uh, characterized this as attaching a, a garden hose to a fire hydrant. <laughs> Uh, Thank the, you. The money, the money is, has been extraordinarily uh, large in many cases. And DOE also then had to ramp up as a result to, to manage the DOE stimulus portions. Is that correct? That is correct. Is that the same uh, hose to fire hose? Absolutely. Very good. 
Uh, in your testimony, you state that you are now in the process of evaluating contingency, and I quote, evaluating contingency plans to address problems with transitioning to a post-recovery act uh, funding posture. The immediate concern you identify is how the department will deal with the significant, again, quote, significant downsizing of the contractor workforce. Do you have any estimates of how many contractors will lose their jobs at DOE after Recovery Act funding runs out? I, I don't have that. Okay. Don't Mr. Isakowicz, uh, as uh, CFO, can you comment on that question? Uh, many of these uh, activities we expect and hope would continue, that, that the economy would, as was the intent of the Effort Recovery Act to be targeted and temporary, would allow uh, activities to follow from that. To speak to some of the specific ones, uh, I'm going to turn to Inez, who can speak most directly to your question. Yes, our um, in approach in the environmental management program was uh, to create temporary jobs and train those workers to work in the important field of uh, a nuclear and um, a radioactive uh, um, contaminated areas. So <clears throat> what we um, did was uh, to concentrate on footprint reduction, which then creates assets of now liabilities in the communities where we have installations in the environmental management complex so that the um, um, communities could um, enter into economic development um, um, efforts using uh, the assets that the environmental management program through the Recovery Act was able to put at their disposal. We um, uh, intend to um, reduce the active cleanup um, um, uh, footprint by 40 percent by the end of uh, 2011. And in addition to that, of course, uh, we have uh, the small business development that uh, we have been able to accomplish. We have uh, awarded $1.8 billion out of the $6 billion to small business in the Environmental Management Recovery mm -hmm. Act. And we have been able to create infrastructure in the small businesses in to terms be able of to the compete in the national and international um, nuclear industry. But in terms of estimates of how many contractors will lose their jobs at DOE, do you have any, any it, idea? In, in the environmental management program, you know, we're talking about 2,000 just like uh, was uh, okay. stated at the beginning. All right. Uh, Mr. Rusko, uh, GAO has spent the last, uh, thank you, uh, thank you. Mr. Rusko, uh, GAO has spent the last two years evaluating how states and locality, uh, localities are implementing the stimulus. Now that we're nearing the end of its funding in 2012, what impact will this have on the states? And will those workers, uh, the, the states added uh, to implement these programs, be furloughed? Um, in, in some cases, we're we're going to see with the with the end of Recovery Act, we're certainly going to see kind of a cliff effect of of jobs ending, and, and environmental management is one such case. Already, we're seeing reductions in employment in the fourth quarter of last year over uh, the third quarter, and expected decreases in in employment after that. So if we if we go back to the the regular annual budget for that, then there will be a, a large drop off in jobs at, at, at the at the sites. Thank you. And Mr. Isakowitz, I think you in response to Mr. Sullivan's question asked whether or responded if the primary uh, job or the primary purpose of the stimulus was to create jobs and I believe your uh, answer was yes. Is that correct? I think that was directed to you. It's to create jobs and to make long term investments for our economy. There was a, a grant that was awarded by the Department of Energy uh, to a city in my district that was over $2 million, uh, and it's uh, less than 50 percent completed, and it says zero jobs were created. This is according to the, uh, to the, the website that reveals information on grants awarded and how many jobs have been created. How many awards have been granted that have created zero jobs by the DOE? Um, I, I can't speak to, to that specific one, but, but in every case, uh, the, the recipient who we've worked with identifies back to us how many people have, in fact, been employed as a result of the, the dollars that they receive. So anybody who's received a dollar from us clearly has created some kind of work that they should be reporting back to the system. But we'd be happy to get back to this specific example for the record. Okay. Thank you very much. And then in terms of uh, – time? I yield back my time. Thanks. Oh, I thank the gentleman. Uh, we just want to get the vote. I'll just close. Uh, uh, Mr. Freeman, I put into the record uh, 
a year letter of October 14th where you'd indicated that, and this is considering the state of Illinois' weatherization assistance program, you said, our testing reveals substandard performance in weatherization workmanship, initial home assessments, and contractor billing. These problems were of such significance that they put the integrity of the high of the entire program at risk. Uh, so that was one of the uh, put in. I want to thank our witnesses for coming today for the testimony and members for their devotion to this hearing. Uh, the committee rules provide that members have 10 days to submit additional questions for the record uh, to the witness. And with that, a subcommittee is adjourned.